All right, guys, lots of stuff happening on the GTO, a lot of stuff kind of overlapping, but in this episode, we're gonna rebuild the Turbo 400. Now, it already had upgraded everything internal, shift kit, all that fun stuff, but there was a little bit of sludge at the bottom that I didn't really like that much. So we bought a kit for it and I wanted to do it myself, but I figured to make a great video, uh, better ask somebody who does it all day, every day. So we headed over to Joe's transmission and he showed us exactly how to rebuild it. And you can do it yourself, just take your time and, and watch the video. It's uh, not that bad. What are, what are you guys doing? So if they just if yeah. you just uh, click the link below, you'll get that extra 200 gold and a protective shield. Hey guys, Blackjack here. We're gonna go check out my buddy's shop in Niagara Falls, Joe's Transmission. He's gonna do an awesome rebuild on the GTO. But first I wanted to talk to you for a second about Viking War of Clans. Viking War of Clans is inspired by strategy and RPG games from the 90s, which were sweet and fun to play. Another cool thing about this game is that there's over 20 million people online playing, so the game is constantly evolving and strategies are changing. All right, guys, we're gonna have a little heart to heart. The MG Midget build, it needs your help. Costs a lot of money, I gotta buy clutches, all kinds of stuff. Help support DeBoss and the MG build by clicking the link below and downloading the game for free. You'll get an extra 200 gold and a protective shield. And you can join my clan, Blackjack DeBoss. Well, when you need extra protection, you use the shield. You well, know what I mean? Well, everyone needs protection, but how do I use it? <laughs> Just click it. Where do I click? Right here. <laughs> Previously on the GTO build, prime it and paint it inside this shot, and then we'll take it to the paint booth and spray the putty on the outside. What can you say is more badass than a 67 GTO? It's really hard to work on the GTO when you get a giant all the time. All right, we're at Joe's transmission. We got the Pontiac 400 there, which isn't really Pontiac, just the bell housing, right? Yep, we're gonna disassemble it, inspect all the hard parts, clean each piece, lay it out on the bench, and we'll assemble it. This isn't your first one, right? No. <laughs> Doing this stuff since I was 16 years old, so. <laughs> Sounds good. So, this is a turbo 400, yep. uh, 350 is basically the same layout. No, the parts in the 400 are way heavier, yep. stronger, Okay. Uh, different ratio in the planetary gear set. Uh, case, they're pretty close to length. There's maybe a half inch, three quarters of an inch between um, turbo 400, modulator valve always on the side, turbo 350, it's in the back corner. Okay. Uh, basically it works similar modulator valve governor assembly. So uh, then what we're gonna do first, we're gonna roll it over, get the pan off. Okay. Take the valve body out. Okay. Then we're gonna take the pump out and we're gonna continue from there. Sounds good. This is your uh, solenoid for your kick down. I get the filter off and then that's the valve body. Governor feed tubes. You always want to be careful that you don't damage them. This is your separator plate, valve body gaskets on both sides. This is your accumulator piston that that solenoid operates that engages your band for passing gear. Always leave it on the bench to drain down before it goes in the Marsal tank. The early 400s all have six balls in it. This one has three, so there's been some updates done to the valve body. Well, I don't usually do this because I always know where they go, but the ones that had the uh, three check balls in, we're gonna mark for reference. Underneath this servo cover is your accumulator for your reverse band. They always use, because there's so much pressure in here, they always use a steel gasket. That way it doesn't blow up. And that's the accumulator? Yeah. 
servo for the reverse pin. It's a servo inside of a servo. Now we're gonna pull the pump out of it. But before we do that, we're gonna knock the front seal out. On these front pumps, there's usually two holes that are threaded, and then we'll use this tool pump puller to knock the pump out. Wash up for the pump holes. Complete front pump assembly, forward drum, intermediate drum, that's the one that's got your spray on it. There's the band we were talking about. Now we're going to take out the intermediate clutches and steels. This is an aftermarket snap ring in these intermediate clutches because when you use the stock one, sometimes these little prongs inside the case will break off. So this is stronger. Oh, okay. So there's usually three friction in there. Now this is the center support and the intermediate drum rides on it. So now there's another snap ring that holds that in. Plus there's a bolt that secures it in the case. You need a 12 point socket for that. It's gonna be hard for you to see this, but this is an actual beveled snap ring. Yep. And it has a really tight fit to keep that center support secure. That's why it's difficult to get that one. That's just not a bolt, it's an actual feed hole. And that's what fills this cavity to push this piston out to engage these intermediate clutches. I see. And then of course there's pouring tins on each side of it. Dampener ring that rides in the drum. This drum has inner spray. Your reverse band rides on this, but this is your front planetary. Before we pull the rear planetary out, I'm gonna take the governor support out so we don't damage the nylon gear. <coughs> Valve inside. Oh yeah, yeah. That helps control your shift. Output shaft, rear planet, sun gear. Torrington's on both sides of it. This is an aftermarket Torrington bearing that somebody has put in the back. Okay. Because usually they come with a thrust washer. This is a little snap ring that your center support actually sits on when it sits in the case. And there's your reverse band that we were talking about. Next, we're gonna pull the modulator out. Once the modulator comes off, there's an actual modulator valve that rides in the case. We're going to knock the tailstock off. We're going to put the case in the tank for cleaning. While the tank's being cleaned, we're going to knock, I call this our hard parts. We're going to knock the rest of the hard parts apart, inspect everything for wear, get the pistons out of the drums so everything can be resealed. Over This valve is supposed to slide free in the case. Yeah. So we're gonna actual we're gonna polish this valve after we clean everything. And what does that valve do? The modulator valve? That actually tells the transmission it's gonna be vacuum operated from the engine, and then it's actually gonna pull on this valve and it's gonna control the shift pattern okay. of the transmission. How high you want it to shift or how okay. early you want it to shift. Okay. This is like a stock GM modulator valve. On the aftermarket ones, there's an actual adjusting screw inside. Oh, okay. So if you want the transmission to shift earlier, yep. you can turn the screw oh, out a okay. little bit. Yep. If you want it to shift higher, you can turn the screw in a little bit. Nice. Next, we're gonna pull the sp speedometer housing out that holds your speedometer gear. Yep. Uh, a lot of times these housings get seized in the case. So hopefully this one comes out fine. And the reason we're gonna pull it out is because when, because we're freshening up the transmission, there's inner and outer seals. So we don't wanna have any leaks when we're done. 
Now obviously your speedometer cable screws on this, so you want to be very gentle with it. And we're going to give it a little wiggle, see if we could walk it out. If you don't slip, you won't wreck the threads. Yeah. <laughs> Going. There, we go. there we go. Somebody's somebody's put a lot of sealant on it at one time. <laughs> we're gonna knock the output seal out of it, and then we're gonna take the tailstock off. There's your inner speedo gear. There's the gasket that goes in between the main case and the tailstock. Last thing we're gonna do before we clean the case is we're gonna take the shifter arm off because when the shaft runs through the case, there's a little seal in there and we wanna change that. Because as you can see, all the years of road dirt and everything build up in there, they cause that little seal to leak. And we have a special tool to extract that seal out of the case. This tool will actually screw it into the seal. Hopefully we got enough bite. Then we turn this bolt in, it pushes up against the shaft. And there's your shifter seal. Now we're gonna take the case, it's completely disassembled. We're gonna take it to the wash tank and give it a bubble bath. So <laughs> when we put this thing together, everything is clean. Nice. We'll take the paint off. It'll take a lot of the paint yeah, off. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so a Turbo 400 in its stock form can handle about 450 foot-pounds of torque. Um, if you go back to our engine dyno video, uh, our 400, with us not knowing anything about it, uh, the engine itself, put out about 430 foot-pounds of torque at 2800 RPM. Now, we're hoping to get a bit more. Our final goal for this car is about 500 foot-pounds to the tire. Um, we're doing that with uh, EFI on it and some better flowing heads eventually and, and we'll take you guys along the ride for that. But we're happy to see that there were some upgrades done to the transmission already. With an upgraded uh, shift kit and uh, heavier parts uh, already in the 400, we should be safe to put uh, 550, 600 foot pounds to the tire without without doing any damage and reliably being able to take it on long cruises. Now, we'll show you guys how to upgrade it, um, but when you're going to rebuild one of these, it's the same rebuild process, whether it's upgraded or not. We definitely want to show you how to be able to handle six, seven, 800 foot pounds of torque and the kits get more expensive as it goes. But at the end of the day, it's just bigger, thicker cages and planetaries and sprag clutches to be able to handle that for you guys. So um, check it out, here we go. Put the case in the tank, got it all cleaned up. It's ready for assembly. Inspected all the uh, hard parts, cleaned and prepped. I've gone ahead and resealed our piston on our center support and our input drum. One thing that's very interesting that I wanted to show you guys, this intermediate sprag. This has a 32 element roller sprag in it. Okay. Which only came in the early 400s, big blocks. Okay. Uh, three quarter ton vehicles. Um, the later model 400s all had your roller and spring type okay so in a high performance application this is what you want to use if you can't get your hands on an early drum to buy this assembly is 400 bucks us nice so i'm very pleased that it's got this style in it from the factory there's an inner seal that rides in this drum upside down in a high performance application we don't use it. this is a lip seal the lip actually points down because you're trying as a cavity, you want it to seal so the oil can engage the piston. Just like that. Same with the outer, same idea, just different design. Do you lube it up at all? Yeah, we're gonna show you that. This is a special transmission lubricant. It comes in different, different formulas and different colors it either comes red or green the green's a little thicker this grease actually gets hot it turns into transmission oil. okay 
where in the olden days guys used to use white lithium grease or or an all-purpose grease wall it's not good for the training okay not good for the friction inside now is that seal on the piston directional is there a lip yeah. one way or another okay yeah. and the piston is cut so if you were to put that seal on upside down you would never get the piston in the joint so basically you want to try and get this piston started be very gentle this is a feeler gauge style tool okay so i'm using this to get the lip started in the drum once you get it started you can almost work it you want to make sure because i've done this for 35 years i've got the feel of it and i know when the seal's in and i'm gonna drop right just in. like that yeah perfect so when you do it all the time it looks easy the, the key is if you're doing this at home you want to be delicate with it yeah you don't want to cut that lip seal yeah these are your return springs the plate goes on top i have a special fixture for installing the snap ring in here i used to use that tool that's hanging up on the wall it works awesome i always position a snap ring in the exact same spot that way for me it's familiar I'm, I'm not looking for it once i compress the retainer you want to make sure you get this started properly on the drum that you don't get caught in your snap so now it's down all the way beauty always make sure your snap ring is locked in yeah This transmission was in fairly good shape, except the friction in this drum. If you look, see you got the waffle on that side? See how it's worn off? Yep. So these are actually on the thin side. They're not burned up, but you can see the heat marks in the steel plates. Yes, yeah. yeah. So we got a fresh set of steels that go in here. Now this, this first steel plate is actually a wave plate. So it's not perfectly flat? It's not perfectly flat. I don't know if you can see yep. that or not. Yep. Is what that does, it gives you a little softer engagement when you put it into gear. Five friction go into this drum. I always pre-soak these before I put them in. So basically we started off with the wave plate. So you're gonna go clutch steel clutch steel so on until you're done now the steel only fits in one way i see a flat spot this steel will fit in in every hole okay this is like an identification okay so i always like lining them all up because this actually gives you another passage for oil to escape when the friction is yep. applied you hear that there's a lip that oh, yeah. this pressure plate sits on. Okay. If it doesn't hit that lip, it's hitting the clutch plate and it's gonna be too tight. Okay. Now GM recommends different clearances in different applications and different drums. This one's probably between 40 and 90 thou. But as long as you can turn this clutch, you know it's not bound up and I can move it so we're good to go. Like I said, I just, I wanted to leave this drum so you guys can visualize on how it went together. Uh, yesterday when we took this apart, I explained to you it's got a Torrington in the back yep. rather than a thrust washer. Yep. So somebody has updated the training to that. So that's what we use in all our high performance applications. I always dip these Torringtons in transmission oil. A little bit of lube on the bottom of this uh, rear planet because it rides in the bushing in the case. So this is the output shaft and the rear planetary. So yeah. which which gears would that control? Okay, this this is going to be applied in first and reverse. But in first it's locked. In first it's locked up. Okay. Then when it gear change, then it'll it'll spin when the friction releases. Um, on the rear planet, the front planet sits on it. And that's the one we talked about yesterday that the band grabs this drum, yep. locks it up, and it gives you your, your reverse rotation. Okay. 
Uh, before we go any further, we're going to put the reverse band in. Okay. On a Turbo 400, these are sometimes a little tricky because there's two dowels in the case that this side has to lock into. And then your servo that we showed you yesterday, that's how it applies yep. it. We want to try and get this lined up and partially started. And then now you have to work it without binding it up. You got to try and work it down into the case. And you can see, you can see the, the two dowels down in the case that this pan rides on. So what I do is I'll stick a screwdriver in where the band rides and finish positioning the, the band into the right location. Okay. Right there. Yeah. So you want to make sure it's sitting nice and square. You want to make sure it's locked into your dowels. Yeah, so dowel right there, and then you can see the screwdriver coming yeah. through pushing. Yeah. This is where the, the pin on the piston is going to apply it. This thrust washer is going to sit in between the front and the rear planet because that way when it goes the opposite direction, you're not steel on steel. Yeah. So basically you want to put some trans gel on here to hold it into place while you're assembling because it has these little dog legs that fit into these notches in the planetary. And if they're not in position, your drum's not gonna sit down properly. There's the dampener ring we showed you that rides in between them. A little bit of lube on them. This is your one-way clutch or sprag, we call it. So that way there, it only allows this drum to turn in one direction. And can you get that back rinse or just won't no, fit? No, you can't get it in. Sometimes they're just a little tricky getting into place. Sometimes you actually have to push on these rollers just a hair to get past the, uh, the edge of the drum where they ride. There you go. Now the reason I put this together as a complete assembly, because it's a lot easier to slide it into the case than to try and put the top planetary on the band, bottom planetary because you don't want to disturb the band. And the same deal on the touring tins. We'll put a little bit of gel on them, keep them into place. Now we'll set the assembly in. Just like that. Nice. It's all pretty well flush with the band there. Yep. Uh, nothing yeah, that, really to sit up against or catch. Or... The width of that band pretty well rides on the whole width of that drum. Okay. This intermediate shaft rides into that sun gear that's in the middle of the front planet. And it's, it's keyweighed. So it, it will only go in one way. Then on this center support, which I already re cleaned and resealed, from the factory, there's four oil rings on here. This particular model only has three. We leave this one off because of the updates that are done in the valve body. Okay. It, it doesn't call for that oil ring. Okay, so it's just those three rings? Yeah. And just cleaning and that's it with yeah. that piece. And resealed, the, there's a piston oh, there's, in here as okay. well that engages our intermediate clutches. Thrust washer that rides on the inside of this center support. And then another Torrington. So what I always do is I put the, the top race on a center support. I take the bottom race with the Torrington, same deal, we're gonna lube it. And we're gonna slide it right on this intermediate shaft and that is gonna keep it completely lined up to drop that center support. Now on this center support, this will go in a couple different ways. Okay. But, there's that feed hole that I showed you yep. that the bolt goes through yep. the uh, the channel on the case. 
that has to be lined up with that. So, because I've done this a million times, I got a few references like this one spot that's partially machined. I see where it sits in the case here as well. So, you got to make sure you got to hold it and make sure it goes in nice and square. Otherwise, it's going to bind up in the case. Then as soon as I turn the output shaft, it allows the center support to fall into that spray assembly. Okay. The bolt, it's got the feed hole in it. Now this doesn't actually have to go in until we're gonna put the valve body in. Okay. But once I get the center support in the case, I always like to just thread this in to know everything's properly in, in place. And there we go. Fitting. We were going over these snap rings. And I showed you the one that goes on the center support is an actual beveled. Yep. That's so when this slides into the case, the more the bevel goes into the case, the tighter it keeps the snap ring in place. If you don't have this snap ring properly in place, you could tear this whole transmission case in half. <laughs> Good to know. So again, this, because this spring, has so much pressure on it, you really gotta fight sometimes to get it into place. There's only 100,000 people watching you, so. <laughs> you get it the first time, right? So basically, I try and get it started on the one end, and then I'll work it around. And again, I always, always try and be very thorough to make sure it's locked in. Yeah. So now that all that's in, we're gonna to go to our intermediate friction. So we're gonna dip them in some oil as well. And same routine as this clutch drum. It's gonna start off with a plate that's partially waved. Sometimes these have a little notch in them like our steels in that, sometimes they don't. So same deal, steel clutch, steel clutch. These discs don't have the wafer in it? No. It all depends on the years. Okay. But some of the later years, they actually used a little bit of a wafer spacer plate that snapped into that piston. Okay. And then your pressure plate sits on top and it's it can only go in one way. Just like that. Now this is that aftermarket snap ring. Uh, there's a couple different companies make it, Sonics makes it. Uh, you can actually order it through Transco. Same deal as the bottom snap ring. I've seen the OEM snap rings actually pop out of the case and they'll tear off all these aluminum inserts that hold the snap ring in the case. Okay. So this one just has more tension or? It's like twice the size. Okay. And it has way more tension. There we go. Beautiful. What I do after I get these intermediate clutches in, sometimes I'll just take a screwdriver and I'll just kind of want to line yeah. the teeth up on this friction a little bit because it makes it easier for when you're trying to work your, your drum in. Now, before this drum with the spray goes in, we're, we got to put the band in because you're not going to get this band in after you put the drum in. And again, there's a dowel in the case that locks in, and then your servo applies it. So it basically just sits like that. You know, you got your forward and your direct drum. This drum, either it's gonna fall right in, or you're gonna play with it. You wanna feel it slide into each clutch plate three times because there's three friction yeah and then you'll hear it bottom out and you're going to know it's in all the way this oil ring on the center support make sure that they're locked in they're all keyed there we go there's two
Sometimes you really gotta play with them to get them yep. started. Yeah. There we go. There's two ways of knowing this has dropped in all the way. I can tell from the final drop how it hit. Yep. You can actually hear it solid. Yep. Yeah. yeah, I heard a definite clunk, not a, like a clutch plate sliding. It was yeah. a definite clunk. Yeah. And when I look down in between the drum and this input, I can see where sp our spline on the drum is even with that spline on that intermediate shaft. So yeah. I, I know it's in all the way. Same deal, we're gonna take a look here. Make sure our frictions are mediocre lined up. So it's gonna start. Now the one thing that I gotta do on this drum here, it basically uses the same friction and steel as the other drum, except it has an inner hub on it. There's two thrust washers on this inner hub. There's a bronze one that rides in between the hub and the drum. Yep. And there's a plastic one that rides in between the hub and the drum we just put in. So this is what that thrust washer looks like that's on the bottom side of that hub. It's a bronze washer. This is a replacement washer because the one that was on it had some heat in it and it was actually melted on the edge. I was hoping I could find it to show you. <laughs> <laughs> I'll find it when everything's put away. Yeah. <laughs> All things so assembled. Same deal. We want to put a little lube on it to hold it into place. And then this one here will be hopefully a little easier to put in than the first one. Here we go. Perfect. That easy. I took the pump apart on it this morning, inspected the pump, cleaned it, checked the pressure valve to make sure it was nice and free, uh, installed the new seal. I have different hose clamps for different pumps. Yep. This is a tool that we use. This is a ring that you buy. So basically you want to make sure all your bolt holes and oil holes are lined up and the pump stays square while you tighten up the bolts. Okay. If the pump's not square, you could have an oil leak and the pump can be very difficult to put in the case because the case is machined for okay. this. Okay. So if an, what would an oil leak feel like when you're driving it? It could burn up the transmission. Okay. You could, you could get a cross leak in between the two pump halves. Okay. I'm gonna be tightening it up just like when you put a wheel on a car. You're gonna go opposite from each other yep. and then around. It's going to be somewhere between 140 and 150 inch pounds of torque. Okay. These are 5 16 bolts in here. Again, same deal. I already put the thrust washer on. It's it's oiled up. We're going to put the two oil rings on here. Now these oil rings, they're basically the same size as the ones that's used on a center support, and they have locking tabs on them. So when they go into place, a little bit of oil. Now this is basically the same thing as when you're putting an engine together. When I put these oil rings on... Stagger. Yeah, I make sure it's locked in, and then I'll actually put them opposite of each other. You know, they're supposed to total seal, yep. but it's just something I pump all tight. We're going to take our uh, retaining ring off. And that's what you're learning. And then in this groove goes an o-ring square cut they actually put a reference line if you can see it's almost like a white paint yep that way when you put this o-ring on if you were to roll it yeah you could see it so just do a look beautiful same deal you gotta lube it up otherwise you're gonna damage it when you put the pump in the case before we put the pump in there's a, a case gasket that goes in between the pump and the case. I like greasing it as well, so I know it seals. It has a nice uh, dry gaskets. Don't 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 seal that well. No, that's a real bitch for the next guy because he has to scrape all that shit off. <laughs> like I know which way this goes in because I can see my feed holes and stuff. But there's that side of the gasket, and then they put a, a reference mark. Reference goes up. It's facing you. So if we look, I can see all our passages, all our bolt holes. Yep. 
our feed holes, everything's lined up. I always try and make sure the gasket is lined up as nice as I can to make sure we don't have any restriction. Now, because this case is all cleaned, it's dry. So I like putting a little bit of oil, even though the O-ring is greased up, just to help everything slide in nicer. We're gonna find a reference point. One of these bottom, there's your, your feed holes and there's your bolt holes. I'm gonna put this screwdriver and use it as a lineup device. So obviously we've got it in the last bolt hole on the bottom, which is right there. So it's, it's gonna allow us to put the pump in and everything to line up properly when we go to bolt it. So basically the pump just dropped down to the O-ring. So that's telling me my oil rings are already started into the drum. I don't want to say gently tap, but it's by feel. And I'm going to go back and forth. As you can see the pump going down. It's bottomed out in the case. Right. I don't like putting a bolt in and trying to draw it in because if an oil ring gets cocked, you're gonna break it. On all the pump bolts, there's there's washers with paper gaskets on them. See how the paper's all chewed up? Yeah. We're gonna put new washers on there to make sure we have no leaks. You wanna make sure that all your bolts thread in by hand so you know everything's totally aligned before you run them in. So we've got all our new washers on the bolts. Again, this is an early 400. So this pump actually has one more bolt that holds the pump to the case versus the later model ones. You could actually use a later model pump in an early power glide, but not vice versa. Otherwise you'd have a hole that you could get a leak in. So when you say early, do you know the year break? I think they changed it in the mid 70s. Okay. So basically we're gonna tighten this pump up the same way as we did the inner part of the pump. There we go. Grab the input shaft, make sure it spins free. Now we're gonna roll this over. Right now you can see a little bit of end play. Yep. That's telling me everything's in place. Next step, before we go any further, we're gonna put the uh, servo in for the reverse band. On this servo, Obviously, there's we put a new O-ring on it. Teflon seals on the inner piston. You want to make sure that this sits square. Just like that. Return spring. You can't just put your cover on and bang it in. I like to make sure that the outer seal is clear on the lip of the case. That way, if you were just to put the cover on and not do that, you could cut that right. that seal on that outer right. piston. And it, it's in a little crooked and no worries. That's, that's the way it rides in the case. Oh, okay. Like we showed you yesterday, this uses a steel gasket. Yep. And then it's crimped to give you your, your oil seal. Your cover, there's six bolts. Hold this cover on. Again, same thing as the pump. You wanna make sure all the bolts, we've got the piston down in the case, so we know we're not gonna damage the outer seal. So obviously you wanna make sure you get all six bolts started before you tighten any of them up. And you do, in this particular training, you've got half a dozen bolts that are all the same size. So you don't wanna get any of them mixed up. Um, you know the ones that came from the outside of the transmission have paint on them, so. So those are the four for the cover and for the modulator valve. Our two for our kick down solenoid and our last one for the cover. Now, before we go any further, we don't wanna to get too far ahead of ourselves. So now we're gonna tighten that bolt up in that center support. <laughs> Because if you forget to tighten that up, you'll have no reverse. And will it spin and then not line up the hole again? 
No, it won't spin. Oh, okay. So, so then you got to pull it apart. To, right. So you have to pull the valve body back off again and put the bolt back in. Yeah. Now this is our servo for the kick down band. I always make sure because that band will slide back and forth. So I always want to make sure that I'm, I'm going to catch it. Right. The oil ring on this servo doesn't have a lock on it. Okay. So you got to make sure that you feed it in. Yeah. Before we get to the valve body, we talked about from the factory, it had six check balls in it. You've got one, two, three, four, five, six. Because this valve body's been reprogrammed and it's a high performance application, it only uses three check balls. And by reprogrammed, it's basically just a different valve body. Uh, like a shift kit, high performance okay. application. That's why when I disassemble these things, I always try to pay attention because you don't know who's been in here, you don't know what's been done. The way they sell these kits nowadays, because there was a difference from the early to the late model valve bodies. Some of the late model valve bodies use seven check balls. This is how you identify your valve body gaskets. There's a C for case, and there's a VB for valve body. The top gaskets are all the same. The bottom gasket is different. And I believe this is the gasket I need, but we're gonna put the two on top of each other and see where the difference is. And when I find it, I'll point it out to you. <laughs> there should be one hole that's cut a little differently than the other. Yep. Oh, yep. right here. Yep. <laughs> so at the same time. So this is the one. So that's the early. This is the late. It's okay. cut like that because there would have been an extra check ball in the case. Okay. Even though I've been doing this for a lot of years, I'll still put my gasket on my separator plate and I will verify that I'm not blocking any holes that I yeah. it, is, it is the correct gasket. Yeah. Gaskets I always always dip the transmission. Two reasons for that. I feel the gasket seals better once it's been on oil number one. Number two, when you're putting this in place and you're lining up two gaskets, a separator plate, and a valve body, there's less chance of things moving around. The top one's got the VBs, gonna go against the valve body, so we'll shoot that in oil. I always like letting the oil drip off a little bit, so. So now, before we put the valve body in, obviously we put the last gasket on, but I'll take some of the valve body bolts and I'll put them in the case to keep everything 100% lined up. So this way, when we put our solenoid on for our passing gear, we it's going to hold the separator plate to the case and we're going to know everything's lined up. On the URI style, GM had two types of these. This is the early one. So this solenoid gets a steel shim, like a, a washer, same as what's on the reverse servo. On the later ones, they had a rubber seal built into it. And if these solenoids go bad, the transmission won't shift because it's simulating like it's in passing gear all the time. Okay, so it's stuck in first? It's stuck in first. Okay. That's the only electric thing in the transmission. In this transmission. Okay, so what, like when does that get power? Well, first of all, we want to plug this sucker in <laughs> so we don't forget. Yep. On a lot of the GMs, yep. on your particular car, on the Chevelles, the GTOs, a lot of them, if you look on the firewall, on the inside above the gas pedal, okay. you'll see an electrical switch that the arm of the pedal rides up against pulls a lever up and down. Okay. And that's what sends the power to the solenoid. On some of the other ones, once they got into the trucks and stuff, uh, sometimes they put it uh, right on the, on the carburetor if they bolted it to the intake manifold. Now that we got that, we can get these bolts out of here. Now this morning I cleaned up the valve body, 
made sure it took a little screwdriver, made sure all the valves were free. The trick is when you're putting these valve bodies in, you have to get these governor feed tubes in place okay and kind of bring it down as an assembly and those seals on that they just pop in the hole interference pop. bit this is your manual valve oh, yeah that's gonna go in your manual linkage yeah. so you have to line that up at the same time these feed tubes have a really tight yeah. fit. no seals on this uh valve that's all interference no. So basically you want to make sure it's all lined up, that all your bolts start nicely by hand. On these 400s, they use uh, mostly 5 16 bolts, but then there's three quarter inch bolts. Is what I'm thinking is when they design the uh, channeling in the case, to control your oil passages. There just wasn't enough room for a 5 16 spool. And then this is uh, part of your positioning. So when you put it in each gear. It's just a detent. It's thing. like a detent to lock it in, yeah. We're gonna run these bolts down. I always like doing the 5 16 spools first. Once they're down, we'll do the quarter inch. I just want to verify that these feed tubes are down all the way. Now, because of the valve body has a series of valves in it, I always like to make sure that I know if it's not torqued on properly, you could get a valve sticky. So I, I will torque these with my uh, inch pound torque wrench. Uh, well, we'll go to 150. So they're all pretty close to being right there. Quarter inch, obviously not as high. Probably 120. There we go. It's very critical to make sure you get this seal with everything clean. We use the assembly lube on it. You actually gotta turn it, feel it, make sure it's past these flats. Yep on this shaft because if you go to drive this sucker in and it's not you're just going to tear up the seal this seal bottom bottoms out right in the case there it is our shifter arm on the pickups yep the arm doesn't have as much of a okay detent uh, as much of an angle yep. on it and yep. it does go on the opposite. Oh, okay. Yeah, we kind of a dick move putting it right over the pan. That's yeah. a lot of spill the transmission fluid. And again, on these older 400s, it's a lot nice because everything is uh, the size we're used to. Where you get to the, uh, the late model 400s, these valve bodies will be all standard. Uh, your pan bolts, this nut will be metric. Right, and it, right. When they started doing that transition, guys would get hardware mixed up. Governor assembly, very critical. Like already cleaned this up this morning. You wanna make sure that that valve, right inside, there's a valve that goes up and down. As the vehicle RPMs, these weights come out, these inner weights are spring loaded. Yep. And there's different different weights these these inners come in different thicknesses to control the ship so that's engine speed or transmission speed yeah <laughs> oh okay okay see this is a really nice core to do because it wasn't all burned up yeah when you open up a transmission with a lot of damage inside this governor valve is usually hung it's it's stuck in there big time yeah it's i've taken hours to to get that valve freed up i always like to make sure we put a little bit of oil on it because it's it's a steel shaft riding into an aluminum bore, right? Yeah. And again, when it goes in, you're gonna see when the nylon gear goes in, your governor cover and gasket. We'll grab our four bolts. In the olden days, they used to make these gaskets out of cork instead of fiber. And they used to be notorious for leaking. 
And again, because it's a small gasket, a tin cover, I like tightening these up by hand. Because you don't want to distort the cover and cause a leak, so. We're gonna install the output shaft seal in the tail stock. Something I always do, when you pull this lip back a little bit, you'll see the seal is spring loaded. So I always, it's just something I've always done. I always like putting a little bit of lube in here to keep, make sure the spring doesn't spring out of the seal. And I always, even though this seal is such a tight fit, I always put a little sealant around it before I put it in the case. Try and work the seal down as square as possible. And inside the tailstock, there's a bushing. That's what your yoke on your drive shaft rides on. And whenever I do a training, I always put a little lube on that bushing, just in case the person that puts it in the car yep. doesn't put any oil on their yoke. Right. Usually if that bushing's worn, it's because there's a problem with the drive shaft, yeah, CSG yeah. joint or whatever, they, they beat it out of it. Same deal on a tailstock gasket, a little bit of lube. Now this gasket is cut offset with the bolt holes, so it will only go on one way. These holes are, yeah. so if I had this gasket on the other way, it, they wouldn't line up. Tailstock's got this radius machined into it. Helps keep it tight in the case. Okay, yesterday when we took this modulator valve out of the case, it wasn't as smooth as I wanted it to be. So I'm gonna take it over to the Varsol tank. We're gonna just polish it with a little scotch brake. We're gonna dip it in the training oil. It's okay if it's a little snug when we try to get it into place. As long as once it's in where it needs to be, it moves freely. Here's our valve that came out of it. In a lot of cases, I like putting a new one on. This one checks out fine. Okay. You can put your vacuum gauge on it. Uh, a lot of times when the diaphragm goes in it, you'll pull the mod off the unit and you'll tap it on the bench and you'll see transmission oil comes out of it. So, you know, these valves are $50, $60. So if they're good, they're good to use. New O-ring, little bit of trans gel. I always like making sure I feel it seated. Once I get the bolt in, I'm gonna actually hold that modulator valve, make sure it's butted. There's our dreaded speedometer housing that was seized in the case yesterday, so I've cleaned it all up on the outside. New O-ring, lots of grease. There's an inner seal that's held in with a little snap ring, so we've changed that as well. Nice. Big difference from yesterday. <laughs> yeah. On these 400s, there's different housings for different gear ratios. And they actually put what gear should be in this housing casted right in there. Okay. If you needed to make a gear change, sometimes you gotta do a housing change as well. Oh, okay. And by housing change, you just mean that section. That yeah, yeah. yeah. Your oil filter pickup that slides into the case. From the factory, GM used one O-ring on it. I always use two to make sure it seals nicer in the case. These tubes, you can't mix them up because it shows you this end goes in the case, your filter goes on that end. So you go with the double O-ring, lube it up so it fits in there nice. And then this has a really nice fit to it. Back in the olden days, when guys used to have transmission problems and they'd get their service done and it would, it would miraculously fix their problem, it's because on these 400s, they always use a felt line filter. And after 10, 15, 20 years, that felt gets hard and it doesn't want to pick the oil up. Right. Okay. On our, our high horsepower transmissions in drag racing, we use a filter that has a brass screen in it. Now, because this transmission has the longer pickup in the deeper pan, it uses an actual spacer. 
that gets the filter in there a little lower in the bottom of the pan. If the transmission was a little low, it's, it's still going to get the oil in. Now, last but not least, I hate aftermarket pants. They never fit. Because they're made for Taiwan. <laughs> is what I had to do this morning after I cleaned it. I had to lay the pan on the edge of my bench and try and straighten out all these bolt holes because whoever owned it previously, you know, people, they get a leak and tighten the pan, tighten the pan. <laughs> so these fiber gaskets do seal up a lot nicer mm -hmm. than the cork ones do. So as what we're going to do, though, before we put this gasket on, I'm not a big fan of silicone on transmission components. Yep. But on these pans, I always like putting a thin, thin bead in between the gasket and the pan. Not the case because it's a nice machine service. You see on this gasket, they've got a couple holes that are smaller than the rest. That way, if you were working on it on the car, you would just thread your bolts into the gasket and it would help keep everything in place while you're positioning it. Get her in place. Again, these sometimes move around. So I always like making sure I've got all the bolts started before I tighten any up. Now is what we're gonna do, because I hate these pans, we're just gonna tighten this up by hand because we don't want to pinch the gasket yeah. or distort the pan. This is the way we used to do it in the olden days. <laughs> you want to go by feel. You don't want to over tighten it. You want to make sure you're even on all the bolts. So we're just going to run them all down and then we'll go over them once and make sure we're happy with them. Probably 50, 60% of our work is all high performance. Engines, we do a little, little, little bit of engine stuff, a lot of training stuff, rear end stuff. Uh, we're doing a 68 Firebird right now for a customer, putting a 383 stroker in it. And you've had race cars and drag cars? All my life. Yeah. I'm a pretty fortunate guy. I've won two or three championships in my lifetime, won a few big races, competed against guys that have multi million dollar year budgets and done well. Nice. So we're in Niagara Falls, Ontario, Canada. We're on uh, 5488 Arthur Street. We're right off of Stanley Avenue, a couple blocks from the 420. So if you need anything, give us a call. Right on. Okay, so we got the rebuilt 400 automatic, and I can hear the comments already. They're coming. Boo, it's an automatic. Put a manual in it. Well, the car came with an automatic, and I know we've changed a lot of stuff. We've got sniper on it, we've got brake, uh, forward with disc brakes on it, but the Hurst shifter was kind of uh, an expensive option back then. And because it's a Hurst, we're gonna leave it automatic. I'm looking forward to my wife being able to drive it too. So uh, the Audi's manual, my truck is manual. I want a nice cruising car that we can just drive um, comfortably in. So um, that's why we rebuilt the 400. Now the uh, install of the transmission is coming up. We'll talk torque converters later with Joe a little bit. Um, we got also have videos coming up on the sniper install. We've got four wheel disc brake. We're gonna put a Ram Air on it, um, but a lot of them are kind of overlapping because I'm short just a couple small things that I need to actually finish everything. So once those videos are finished, they're coming out. So comment down below what you're most excited about, the exhaust, the sniper, the disc brakes, the paint, or actually driving it. Um, I'm not getting much sleep because I'm pretty pumped about um, getting this off the paint next week. That's the most exciting thing that I'm into. But anyway, I gotta get this header off so I can show you guys the, uh, the O2 install on another video. So stick around for that. Thanks for watching, guys.